So we've already talked about aerobic cell respiration that includes glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. And microorganisms that uh, have the ability to use oxygen will in fact use oxygen uh, as long as it's available to them. But in some habitats, oxygen is limited in its availability, and some bacteria can switch from aerobic respiration over to anaerobic respiration or to fermentation. And in fact, uh, so the ones that can switch, we call them facultative anaerobes. And there are even some that are obligate anaerobes, meaning they can't do anything with oxygen. And in some cases, they're even uh, poisoned, if you will, by the oxygen, inhibited by it. Um, but in other cases, they go ahead and, uh, and ferment, for example, in the presence of oxygen. Now, what we're going to look at for the next few minutes are some anaerobic or anoxic habitats that microbes might find themselves in. And then we're going to look at what happens in anaerobic respiration and in fermentation. Keeping in mind, fermentation is not a form of anaerobic respiration. It is an anaerobic metabolism, but it's not respiration because there's no electron transport going on and there's no exogenous electron acceptor to collect the electrons at the end of the electron transport chain. So let's first take a look at some anaerobic environments. <clears throat> Believe it or not, biofilms, even the biofilms that form in your mouth, are typically, uh, uh, by and large, uh, they are anaerobic, they're anoxic. And that's because of the EPS matrix, the, the capsular polysaccharides that impede uh, penetration by oxygen. And what little oxygen does make it in gets pretty rapidly consumed typically by microorganisms that are either aerobic, you know, strict aerobes, or they're facultatively anaerobic using the oxygen preferentially. Any place that you find high organic matter, like a wastewater treatment plant, um, a eutrophic aquatic system, uh, like the, the coast of San Diego and LA, or a pond in the Midwest that's received a lot of runoff, uh, the intestinal tract of a variety of animals, the rumen of ruminant uh, ungulate animals like cows and, and moose, all very anoxic environments and any microbes that live there, and there are a lot, are going to have to make do without oxygen. Even in the human body we find these anoxic environments. The mouth, primarily because the microbes that are there are largely found in, uh, in biofilms. Uh, the intestinal tract, very heavy load of organic matter, so there's a very heavy biochemical oxygen demand for uh, any traces of oxygen that squeak in there. And again, the facultative aerobes like, uh, like E. coli, for example, that you find near the upper reaches of the intestinal tract are going to scrub out any oxygen before it gets deeper in. Uh, Overexerted muscles will ferment. When we go into anaerobic training, for example, uh, we're demanding that our muscles ferment for a very short period. And then in the female uh, vaginal tract and urethra tend to be very anoxic habitats. And so anaerobic microorganisms are going to dominate the uh, microbial chemistry of these places. I also wanted to mention that puncture wounds are often anaerobic. Um, if you think about, for example, your mom telling you when you were, when you were a kid that if you step on a rusty nail, you can get tetanus. Well, I don't think rust has anything to do with it, but uh, a puncture uh, wound of any kind, whether you're stepping on a broken jar, a very sharp rock, a knife, uh, a nail, uh, and particularly if those items have been contaminated with soil, because Clostridium tetani, the uh, gram-positive anaerobe, spore-forming anaerobe that causes tetanus, uh, is a strict anaerobe, and it needs and it lives in the soil. And so, anything that can get it from soil into deeper tissues, away from most of your vasculature and away from the surface, um, poses a, a significant threat to causing the disease tetanus. Uh, and any other puncture wounds uh, that that reach deep areas, the deeper it goes. And closer to bone it gets, for example, uh, the less vasculature there is and therefore the less oxygen there is. So as a general rule, anywhere that oxygen is excluded, we're going to find is going to be uh, an anaerobic uh, microbial habitat. So blood supply is impeded. Uh, it could be um, dead tissue, for example, necrotic tissue. Um, it could be, um, could be a tourniquet that was applied for some reason. Um, it could be poor blood flow due to, due to disease such as diabetes, or a high density of infectious microorganisms consuming oxygen and therefore, um, therefore uh, uh, making the habitat very anaerobic. And then any place where there's a high BOD, where you've got a lot of organic matter, that's going to cause a demand for oxygen by the respiratory aerobes and leaving, it's going to leave the environment uh, pretty anoxic for the anaerobes to kick in. 
Anaerobic cell respiration looks a lot like aerobic cell respiration. You've got an organic carbon as your electron donor and your carbon source. And you've got some oxidized form of a terminal electron acceptor. That's what TEA is referring to in this image. Uh, in aerobic cell respiration, that oxidized TEA is oxygen, but there's some alternative under anaerobic cell respiration conditions. And the organic carbon is still going to get oxidized, typically all the way to CO2, and the electrons will go into the terminal electron acceptor, and so on the right side of the equation you'll have the reduced form of that. And um, uh, the, the goal, of course, is to produce energy, typically in the form of ATP. So the organic carbon gets oxidized to CO2, the alternative terminal electron acceptor gets reduced to its whatever its reduced state, and, uh, and we maintain our redox reactions, and we maintain a, a delta E that, as you know, leads to a hopefully negative delta G that can then uh, drive the production of, of ATP. Keep in mind that anaerobic cell respiration, as far as we know, is a prokaryotic phenomenon, that only bacteria and archaea can do this. There are, as far as I know, no known eukaryotes that can respire anaerobically with some alternative terminal electron acceptor. And it's not a minor reaction out in nature among the prokaryotes. It's extremely common anywhere you find anoxic conditions. Now what kind of terminal electron acceptors can they choose from? Well, depending on what's available to them, they're going to go with, um, as a community, the community will go with whichever terminal electron acceptor is most oxidized, most electropositive in its reduction potential, and therefore will give the best delta E and therefore the best delta G available. Now for a given species of bacteria, they may only have options for one or two of these, or none at all, and they may not be able to make, um, make the most of the situation. But you're going to find nitrate is going to get used first, because nitrate followed by nitrite will uh, provide the greatest energy yield for a given electron donor. Then we've got two weird ones, solids, manganese oxides and iron oxides. At neutral pH, both of these are precipitates. They're what give uh, soil and sediment their, their brownish, darkish, reddish sort of color that we see. In their oxidized state, there are bacteria, we call them manganese reducers and iron reducers, that can uh, respire on these solid precipitated metals, dumping their electrons extracellularly into these oxides and, and forming the reduced forms that you see on the right. Um, both of which are highly soluble, so in a sense they're dissolving away those cellular com or those um, those uh, mineral components of the soil. Now, sulfate uh, SO four two minus is a real common alternative electron acceptor that we see in marine environments in particular. Any aquatic environment is likely going to have some sulfate, but freshwater environments have very little relative to marine environments. And in fact, marine environments once oxygen's gone, uh, will switch over to sulfate reducing conditions pretty darn fast. The, the, the uh, result of sulfate reduction is typically hydrogen sulfide gas. That is that stinky, rotten egg kind of smell that you get. Um, you, around here, you get it at the wetlands, you know, at the mouth of a river during low tide, uh, when a lot of that reduced sediment that's been buried underwater for a while is now exposed, and all this H2S gas is coming out. It also is highly reactive with heavy metals. Uh, turning them black typically as metal sulfide precipitates and so you can see that blackness if you go to the beach and you dig a little bit you pretty quickly get down below the, the light colored sand and you get into very black sand uh, and that's usually indicative of these anaerobic conditions. The last one that's common that we see on this list is CO2 and that's weird when you think about it because CO2 is the product of most respiratory um, uh, oxidations of organic matter, right? We're turning glucose or acetate or lactate into CO2, but CO2 can actually be an electron acceptor. Now, if you look at a redox tower, you'll see CO2 is a crummy electron acceptor. But when everything else is gone and there's really no other option, there are microbes, and these are all actually archaea, and we call these archaea methanogens. Uh, there are archaea that can produce methane, CH4, the reduced form, really, of uh, inorganic carbon, CO2. And this methane is what we all know as um, as uh, natural gas. It's the same gas that you burn on your stove at home or in your, uh, in your uh, furnace at the house, uh, for example. So in decreasing order of energy yield from nitrate all the way down through CO2, keeping in mind that among pathogenic microbes, nitrate is about the only anaerobic terminal electron acceptor we see. Whereas manganese, iron, and sulfate reducers are very common in nature, particularly in soil and water. And then CO2 reducers, better known as methanogens, 
as far as we know, are all archaea, so the, the, the other prokaryotes, so to speak. All right, so we can go ahead and talk briefly then about, uh, about fermentation. We'll do that on the next video.